Okay, we should be good. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to speak with all of you today. Um, it's interesting giving a talk at a social curiosity workshop because um, I was remarking last night that probably the thing I'm most curious about right now is what you all think of this talk, um, which is a little bit of a funny position to be in. But at the same time, it's what a great audience, right? Because everyone here is curious. <laughs> and so um, I'm really excited to share with you uh, this work today. Okay. So humans have limited resources and they can't attend to or learn everything. So if you watch a kid freely explore their environment, it's clear they make choices about when to engage perhaps in trying to put a straw in a cup and when to give up and move on. And although that is very trivial, um, you know, not engaging with other activities like reading or math can be quite consequential. So in other words, how we allocate our effort really determines who we become. And in my research program, I look at how young kids calibrate their effort, and in particular, how this is guided by their beliefs, their interests, and their abilities. And what's really exciting about studying this in childhood is that so many of these inputs are unknown or constantly changing, and a lot of them are learned from the people around us. Um, and so I'm really interested in, oops, in how kids learn from the social world, how hard to try. Um, and a lot of this work really aims to be close to real world application. Um, I really would like this work to one day help kids uh, and improve their life outcomes. And so that really drives how the research in my lab is conducted. So this motivation to bridge research and practice um, drives our approach where we usually try to identify factors in the real world that relate to kids' motivation or persistence. And then we try to run carefully controlled studies to test for causality. Um, sometimes these work in reverse. Um, and then the goal is to scale up one day to real world interventions. And today I'm just going to walk you through one way, um, one of our studies that's been using this approach. Okay. And so to start, off, to start off with, we wanted to identify factors that related to kids' persistence in the real world. So we looked at how parents behaved when their kid was faced with a challenge, and we wanted to see if any of these behaviors related to children's persistence. So we measured parenting behavior um, during a five-minute parent-child interaction task where they played with these whipsy puzzles. These are not commercially available, so they're novel. Um, and we made sure that they were um, a little hard for these kids because they're standardized. Um, and we just wanted to see how does the parent um, interact with their kid when their only task is see how many of these puzzles your child can create. Uh, and we coded parent behavior based on past correlational parent-child interaction work. We coded their encouragement, so something like keep trying, indirect instruction, find a piece that looks like this, pedagogical questions, does that look like the picture? Direct instruction, put the red piece here, giving up, let's go on to the next one, and taking over, where a parent really places in a piece for the child. Um, and we wanted to see which of these behaviors related to children's persistence outside the lab. And so to get a measure of kids' generalized persistence, we relied on this questionnaire, uh, the um, uh, Colorado Childhood Temperament Inventory, the Attention Span Persist um, subscale, which gets at things like, in general, my child persists at tasks until successful. Okay, so let me show you what this looks like. It says, see how many of these puzzles your child can make. You have to wait a minute. There you go. You make this one. So this one would be, huh? look at the picture. All red. A half red. You see how it is? Right there? So it would stay right here. All red, because there's only four. One, two, three, four. Good. Good. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's see another so example. See how many of these puzzles your child can make. Are you ready? Look, we're going to make this one first. What? Can you do it? Do it fast. Come on. Do it just like this one. So what is what color is this one in the corner? It's all what? Red, red, right. Red. And this one is half and half, right? So do the put all the three reds together. No, like this. How many are here? One, two, right? 
And then you put one on top. Good job. Does that look like that? No. No, let's try again, okay? Good. Now, look at this. This one is right, but it's not in the right spot. Can you switch those around and see if that looks better? Let's see if it looks like this. <gasps> it does, high five! Okay. <laughs> so that gives you a sense of what these interactions look like. And so first we can just see how these parenting behaviors relate. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, these more positive parenting behaviors like indirect instructions and pedagogical questions correlate. Um, what can be seen as these more negative behaviors like taking over and giving up correlate. And these two sets of behavior are inversely related. And if we just look at the averages, parents use a lot of encouragement. Um, they don't give up that much, about once per the five minutes, they maybe move on, and they take over about five times per session, so some, somewhere in between. Um, but remember, the real question was which of these behaviors relates to children's trait persistence. So across all of these behaviors, the only one that related to trait persistence was this taking over behavior. So the more pieces of the puzzle parents placed for their kids, the less persistent they rated them. And this held when controlling for age, education, income, sex, race, ethnicity, and kids' fluid IQ. So it doesn't have to do with their intelligence. Um, so um, this was pretty intriguing, right? We were surprised actually when this when we first looked at this that this was really the only um, relationship that came out. Now I actually have this data set in a larger sample, and this is still the only relationship that comes out. So um, I, I have more faith in this now. But of course, you're probably wondering. Uh, why, <laughs> right? The causal direction is unknown. This is a correlation. And it could just be that parents are reacting to their kids' persistence. So maybe they know, oh, my kid doesn't you know, try very hard and I really want them to succeed here. So I'm just going to take over. Um, but it could also be that parents are causing their kids to persist less because kids could learn something like, oh, maybe I'm not competent here. Or you know what? My parents are just going to do it for me. So why should I even try? Um, and so there's, of course, many other reasons. But we wanted to test this second one with an experimental study. And so we randomly assigned kids to one of three conditions. In the taking over condition, they did these same puzzles twice, and now in a museum setting. And the experimenter, after about 10 seconds, was like, you know what, this is pretty hard. Let me just do it for you. And in the teaching condition, we had kind of like that second mom who was, <laughs> who was really good at teaching her kid. And we had the experimenter cover up the blocks in a very systematic order and, and guide the kids through doing it without placing any pieces themselves. And then we had this baseline no manipulation condition. We gave the kids this puzzle box that looks like it could open up a few different ways, but is actually secretly impossible to open to control for individual differences in kids' um, IQ. And we wanted to see simply how long does the kid persist on this second or this third novel toy um, before giving up and moving on to this other water toy. Um, so we really wanted to see here whether taking over causally demotivates kids, not just on the same task, but actually across tasks. So let me show you um, a video from this experiment. All right, so why don't you try to make the blocks look like this picture? I chose this kid because I liked his hat. <laughs> okay, so she's taking over after about 10 seconds and she's completing the task for the kid. Okay, so she's gonna do the same thing again. She's gonna wait a little bit and then she's gonna go in and take over. She has a script there. That's why she can open it up. You can play with it and see if you can open it up. And if at any point you feel like you can't do it, you can go and play with this other toy and I'll come help you. Okay. Okay. So now he's shaking it. There's something inside. All right, now he's going to play with the other toy and she's gonna come back. And now let's see what the teaching condition looks like. Okay, so she's scaffolding, she's... Down here. Well, what do you need for Maybe a red and white one right there. 
And then we just have one last. Okay, scaffolding her through this. Okay, and she's gonna do this one more time and they're gonna go through and she's scaffolding. So both kids in both conditions have complete puzzles by the end. You play with it and see if you can open it up. If at any point you feel like you can't do it, you can play with this other toy and I'll come help you. Okay. Okay, so she persists the full four minutes before we have to cut her off and you can see she's working pretty hard here. Okay, so let's um, first look at the baseline condition. So this is how long they persist in seconds. And I have run this kind of paradigm enough now to know that this is pretty much what we get every time we run baseline condition is a bunch of noise, huge variance in how long kids persist. Um, but what happens in the taking over condition is kids persist about a minute less than kids in the baseline condition. Um, and they also persist, persist about a minute less than the teaching condition. So this really shows that taking over causally demotivates kids across tasks. Um, and you might be wondering why is the teaching condition not different than the baseline condition? We thought that it might be, um, but really we're not teaching them anything relevant about the next task per se. If anything, we're showing them that this is kind of hard and they might need adult assistance. Um, so that's why we think we're not pushing them above the baseline condition uh, potentially in that, in that um, condition. And I want to note that it doesn't provide evidence that the parents I showed you in that first study are causally demotivating their kid. It simply provides evidence that these same sets of behaviors can causally demotivate children. Okay, so we identified a real world behavior that correlates with children's persistence. And in a carefully controlled study, we found that it causally demotivates them as well. So this, of course, brings up a number of uh, questions, and one of them that we're working on right now is why <laughs> is this the case? Why is taking over demotivating? Um, so does it signal something about the kid's competence? Is it that they're not capable of doing the task, or rather something about their autonomy, that someone will always just step in and do this for them? And so my graduate student, Rayu, is working on that. Um, but, the, but the study I'm going to tell you about next today is why parents are doing this in the first place. Um, and this question is really important to understand if we want to intervene, right? We need to understand how to change this behavior. And so we're trying to understand why parents are taking over. And if parents learn to take over less, will that lead to their kid being more persistent? Um, and this is work led by Rayu and also Mika, who's here today. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and so this is an important question to understand also because it turns out that in America, this behavior is becoming more and more prevalent. So it's being covered in news articles. There's tons of books right now on the overparenting epidemic, um, also in TED Talks. Um, I don't think this is an international trend. <laughs> this, is, this is actually something that I'm really curious to talk to you guys about. I, I think this might be a very, I mean, all the literature is about America. Um, and so this is where I feel weird talking to an international audience, but let me tell you about the problems in the US right now, and we can talk about whether this is a problem elsewhere later. So if taking over has all these negative consequences and there's all these books written about it, why are parents doing it? There's shockingly little research on this question. So this is what I'm hoping to kind of fill in today. So we don't think that parents are trying to harm their kids. We think that parents are actually trying to do what they think is best for their children. Um, and there's a lot of things that parents get, care about in, in a given situation, but one thing that we know parents really care about is their kids' learning. So they really value their kids' learning. And if you just look at their praise, um, we know that they value their learning. So they, they, they praise that they've worked hard, they've improved, they praise um, when they learn something. And so that this means that in situations where they think that their kid might be learning a lot from a task, they should step back and let their kid learn. But in situations where they don't think their kid is learning, they might take over because they can achieve the task more efficiently. And maybe, you know, if, if the kid can't learn something from their actions, it might not matter. Um, so one reason that we think parents might be taking over is actually because they're not accurately representing when their kid is learning. And we think that they might really be underestimating learning on non-traditional tasks, like putting on, or non-traditional, non-academic tasks. These are actually everyday tasks, um, like putting on clothes or cleaning up versus more traditional academic tasks like writing. 
So in our first study, we just wanted to see whether parents' beliefs about their child learning relates to their taking over behavior. And we ran this on cloud research for parents of four to five-year-olds. I also want to note that we are studying this in a younger age range than has usually been looked at. People talk about this as helicopter parenting. Is that a term in Europe? Okay. Um, and that's usually with older kids because this kind of parenting is much more obvious in older kids than it is in younger kids. But this is why I think it's so interesting to study in young kids because I think parents a lot of times don't know what their kid are, is capable of. Um, so we told kids, kids, we told parents, imagine your child is struggling to do some non-academic tasks like clean up toys, put on clothes, open a container, brush their teeth, or some academic tasks, traditionally academic, like sorting objects based on shapes, solving puzzles, and tracing letters. Remember, these are four and five-year-olds. Um, and then we asked them, how likely are they to step in and complete the following tasks for their kids? We gave them a filler questionnaire, and then later we had, you know, we asked them, if they tried on their own, how much would they learn? And so we, what we saw is collapsing across all the conditions. Um, as we hypothesized, parents are more likely to take over when they think that their kid is learning less or will learn less from the actions on their own. And what's interesting is that parents report taking over way more on these non-academic tasks. And they also think that their kid will learn less on these non-academic tasks. Now, importantly, Kids, uh, adults differentiate academic and non-academic tasks, but kids likely don't, right? These are four and five-year-olds. And so it's possible that parents taking over on these non-academic tasks might actually spill over and impact kids' persistence on other tasks. Um, so parents' misaligned representations of learning may have real-world consequences. And remember, I just showed you that when adults take over, um, the demotivating effects actually transfer across domains. So in a second study, you're gonna, we're gonna run a causal study. Um, so now we wanted to see if we could change parents' beliefs about how much their kid can learn on a task, like putting on clothes, a non-academic task, and see if we could cause them to take over less. So this is why I was asking this morning how popular hockey is in other countries, but apparently it's really popular in Finland. So Sarah, you should uh, like this. Um, <laughs> so we, we had uh, a really funny novel task, which is putting on hockey gear. This is actually not very common. Um, and we ran a first study to make sure that kids could do this on their own. So four and five-year-olds, um, there's 19 actions to put this on and four and five-year-olds can complete all of these without parent physical intervention. Okay, so we wanted to see whether we could manipulate parents' beliefs about how much their kid can learn from that and whether that would change how much they take over. So this is how the experiment went. Oh, uh, parents read a note. This might be small for you, but I'll read it here. Parents read, before we start our activity, your child needs to put on hockey clothes. I will soon explain how to put them on. Feel free to help your child as much or as little as you want. And then we said something like, fun fact, children learn a lot from putting on clothes themselves. They learn things like motor skills, problem solving, and self-confidence. The skills children learn from putting on clothes help them develop into capable and independent adults. In the control condition, they read the same beginning thing, um, but in the end, they said many museums have dress-up stations for children where they get to put on various clothes and outfits themselves. Putting on clothes helps children interact with museums and engage with exhibits. So the critical thing is that in both conditions, Children, um, we say that children put on clothes by themselves. We don't say anything about hockey clothes in particular. And we say that in both conditions, children gain something from this. But only in one condition do they gain critical life skills. In the other one, they gain a closer appreciation or engagement with the museum. And afterwards, Rayu explained how to put on hockey gear. We gave them a mirror. Um, Rayu is tiny, so she actually can fit into these four and five-year-old hockey gear clothes. Um, and so we had pictures of her on there, just as a reminder, we really wanted to make it so that kids could do this by themselves. Um, and then we had a little reminder on the mirror. We either said dress up as learning or dress up as happening. And our key thing was how much, how many actions do parents take over? And what's nice about this is we ha uh, have 19 actions that they need to do. So we have a great coding scheme here. So let's see what happens. So this is a control condition. Um, Okay, so immediately, um, remember these kids can put on these clothes by themselves, but immediately the mom just is like, I'm gonna do this. And the kid is very passively uh, and happily uh, being allowed to have these fun hockey gear put up on them. 
Um, so you can see that mom actually completes all the actions herself, even though, as we know, kids can do this. Okay, cute though. Um, okay, and here's what the learning condition looks like. So we see that, you know, the parent is letting the child approach, get the hockey gear. Um, the kid is asking mom for help and the mom says, go look in the mirror. And the kid looks in the mirror and, you know, first, okay, drops it. You know, it's a little bit of a struggle here, but the mom is um, sitting back and actually the kid puts on all the hockey gear themselves. Okay, for the sake of time, we're gonna keep going. <laughs> okay, so what did we find? Well, we did this with 60 parent-child pairs. And in the control condition, we find a lot of variance. So there's some parents that do all the actions for the kid. There's some parents that don't do any, but on average, parents take over about eight out of 19 actions. Um, and the critical question is what happens when parents are prompted to think about what their kid could learn from doing this? Well, they take over about half as much. So now they're only taking over for about four out of 19 actions. Um, so we really squashed the variance and turned parents into low intervention parents um, through this simple manipulation. Uh, and I wanna note, we, we actually didn't find any age effects here for I thought maybe we would because, you know, five-year-olds are potentially more competent than four-year-olds at this, but we didn't find any age effects in how um, their parents treated their kids or any effects of condition. Okay, so why do parents take over? Well, one reason, maybe because they don't think their kid is learning. And importantly, parents might not always be accurately representing when their child can learn, especially on these non-academic tasks. So parents might be unnecessarily intervening in their child's learning, especially on these non-academic tasks and inadvertently hurting their children's chances of developing competencies across domains. And we also found that these uh, beliefs are pretty malleable from just a quick intervention. Okay, but I'm not going out and saying, now we all we have to do is tell parents to think about learning, right? Clearly, that's not going to do the trick because I know there's parents in this room <laughs> um, and we're not ready to scale up to interventions because instead, we actually think that the effectiveness of this intervention is bounded by constraints like time that may urge parents to prioritize other things like the outcome rather than their kids learning in any given moment. So time famine <laughs> is a feeling that you have too much to do in too little time and this is very, very prevalent amongst parents of little kids. Um, and as Charlie Wu has shown, uh, right, time, time uh, constraints might have people prioritize goal completion or exploiting over exploring. Uh, we're kind of uh, inspired by that literature. And so um, we did a two by, our next experiment is a two by two crossing learning, whether we emphasize it or not, and time pressure. Um, and so we haven't run this yet. So uh, this is where I show you fake data of what we predict to find. Um, but we predict, it, it's important to note actually in that first study I showed you that we told parents, take all the time you want. We knew that time, or we hypothesized that time pressure would be a huge um, variable here. And so in that last study, we gave them no time pressure very explicitly. And so we expect that in our learning conditions, um, when, ta when we have time abundance, no time pressure, that we'll find the same effect. That learning will, if we prompt parents to think about learning, they'll take over less. But when we tell them that they don't have a lot of time, that they're under some sort of time constraint, we expect them to take over way more and we're not really sure what will happen in the learning condition, but my hypothesis is that they might prioritize task completion over their child's learning here. Um, so this suggests that psychological interventions like prompting parents to think about their learning actually need to be paired with structural changes in how uh, we support young parents potentially. So our theoretical framework looks something like this. Parents take over when they don't value the process. So this is what we looked at with learning. So when they don't value what their kid can gain potentially from doing the task themselves. And when they really value the outcome. So that's something that we think might happen under time pressure. You just want to get the thing done. And critically, in most situations, you're weighing both of these, right? I've looked at them individually, but I'm hoping in this two by two to put them together. 
Um, because we really think that what happens when parents take over is they're valuing the outcome more than what their kid can learn in a given moment. And at a time of increasing income inequality, higher stakes for educational attainment, and feelings of time pressure, parents might be really prompted or feel the need to make sure that their kid is successful um, at the stake of their kid's learning. So in the United States, this is in older kids like the varsity blues scandal or parents writing their college essays for their kids. But this can also be true in young kids as well. And kids could start learning from a young age that their parents will do things for them. So we're excited to test and explore this framework um, in studies moving forward. But one thing that I think, just because I know this is also a cognitive science crowd, we're interested in these representations, right? What is it that they care about the outcome here? Do they care about it just being completed or do they care about it being perfectly completed? Um, and how might these affect what parents do? But also how do they value the process? How do notions of you know, child competence, they very much play into what you think your kid is capable of learning, how much they're capable of learning, and also, we think that parents, you know, valuation of whether this is important to learn at all, at all play into this. So these are things that we're excited to look at in the future. So today I showed you that parents are unnecessarily intervening more and more in their children's work. This type of over-engaged parenting causally demotivates children. Um, and one reason that parents are intervening is because they potentially are misaligned about when their kids are learning. Um, and also we think time famine, although I don't have data for that yet. So we're really not ready to scale up to an intervention. Uh, that's gonna be a little bit of time from now. But in the meantime, what's cool is that my work is making an impact at least on my friends. <laughs> uh, so this is a video that was sent to me from a colleague in Brazil. And he says, hey, this is my young boy playing. I remembered some of your work on babies when I decide not to help him, which sounds kind of cruel, but just watch this video. <laughs> Okay, so he's asking for help and actually dad almost helps him in there <laughs> and then he, he doesn't. And then the kid gets it and apparently keeps playing with this for a very long time, which is very nice. So, sorry, baby. Um, <laughs> I hope that by stepping back ourselves, we can promote in children, this is where I'll tie it into curiosity. We can promote children's curiosity exploration and learning and help them become the best version of themselves. So um, thank you guys so much for listening. I want to thank um, my lab, our funders, and um, Rayut and Nika, uh, who helped a lot with the second study, and Lynn and Allison, my postdoc advisor for the first study. So thank you so much. <laughs>